Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to another, um, well, welcome to Mrs. Taylor's math class. Uh, we are going to do another night of GED math. These are some more sample questions that I have um, to do for you. If you know anyone who is interested in um, taking a GED test and they need some help uh, refreshing their memory on some of the math concepts that they learned in high school, just uh, share this uh, broadcast with them. And um, that's it. So let's go ahead and get started on um, some of these questions. So the first question says, a painter rented a wallpaper steamer at 9 a.m. and returned it at 4 p.m. He paid a total of $28.84. What was the rental cost per hour? So in order to find the cost per hour, you need to figure out well, how long did he rent the um, steamer. So from 9 to 4, um, what's that? 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 hours. So he rented the steamer for seven hours. So we're going to divide the $28.84 by seven. Um, so this is going to be four, 28, bring down the eight, bring up the decimal. That's gonna be one, seven, one, bring down the four, two. So, um, he paid four dollars and twelve cents per hour. That question is not too bad. Not a bad question. That's a real life situation. I know some people are like this math don't pertain to me, but this is a real life situation. So that's the all. That's the question is pretty good. Okay, next question it says, what is the value of thirty six x minus eight y squared when x is equal to three and y is equal to negative six? I remember doing these in middle school and I could not figure out what in the world I'm supposed to do, but I remember my brother helped me out with this one and uh, it made sense ever since that day. So what you're going to do is replace the x value, the x um, the uh, variable with the, le with the number 3 and replace the y variable with negative 6. So we're going to rewrite this expression. Instead of saying 36 times x, you're going to say 36 times 3 minus 8. And then instead of saying y squared, you're going to say negative 6 squared. And then you just proceed with completing the problem. Now, you complete this problem by completing the order of operation. So let's review order of operation. And let's write that down. Order of operations. And so the order is parentheses. Now parentheses could be actual parentheses. They could be square brackets. And I call these squiggles. I don't know the name of this, the proper name of that particular bracket. But that's what a parentheses is. So it's anything like that. Uh, we have exponents, of course, it's like 4 squared, the exponent is a 2. Then we have multiplication and division, or I can write it as division and multiplication. It's what, whichever one you see first when you're reading from left to right. And then there is addition and subtraction, or it could be subtraction and addition. And again, it's reading from left to to write. So the first thing I'm going to do in my order here is I see I have an exponent. Well, I have parentheses, but there's no operation within the parentheses. So I'm going to do the um, exponents first. So negative 6 squared, I'm going to rewrite this as 36 times 3 minus 8 times, now first I have negative 6 squared that's another skill, is negative 6 times negative 6, which is 36. So this is going to be 36. Now, 
I can move on to multiplication and division. In this case, I have multiplication, I have it twice. So I have 36 times 3, and I also have 36 times 8. So 36 times 3 is 18,9108. And then 36 times 8 is going to be 48, 24, and then 228, so that's 288 here. And so this is 108 minus 28, which you are going to really subtract 288 minus 108, but your answer is going to be negative, so it's gonna be zero, eight, one. So the answer here is gonna be negative 180. And so there's your answer, answer choice B. All right, next question. Annie is planning to planning a business meeting for her company. She has a budget of $1,325 for renting a meeting room at a local hotel and providing lunch. She expects 26 people to attend the meeting. The cost of renting the meeting room is $270. Which inequality shows how to find the amount X Annie can spend on lunch for each person? So Annie has a budget of $1,325. And she knows she has to rent a room for $270. But the rest of the money is going to go towards the food for 26 people. And we're going to represent the amount per person with the variable X. So, I know I have $135. Sorry, I read that all wrong. I have $1,325. Okay. And from that, I know that I need to purchase my food. Well, purchase the uh, renting room. For two hundred seventy dollars, and I know I, I need to add the price of the food. Well, we are going to serve twenty six people, and it says which inequality shows how to find the amount X any can spend for lunch for each person. So we got twenty six people, and X is for each person. So we got to say twenty six times X, and then we know that has to be. 1,325. I'm writing it over here for a reason. I'm writing it like this without uh, equal uh, inequality. So we have to determine which inequality this needs to be. So this is how you need to think about it. I cannot go higher than 1,325. Okay? So this is going to be the... Whoa! Hold on. Turn off the thing. Hold on. This is going to be the max amount I can spend. I can go, I cannot go over that amount. I can, all of this can equal that amount. So I can put an equal sign under here as well. So I cannot go over $1,325. And it also, this amount on the left hand side can equal the amount on the right hand side, which is $1,325. So, looking at my answer choices, I need to figure out which one it's going to be. So, first off, I have 270 without a variable. So, let's get rid of answer choice uh, D and C. Then, I see that um, A and B are the same answer choice on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, they are the same as well, but it's the inequality that is important. So we're going to pick answer choice B because it cannot go over $1,000, $1,325, and it also can equal that. So let's hit B. Okay, next question. So Dominic earns $285 per week plus an 8% commission rate for 
on all his sales. If Dominic sells $4,213 worth of merchandise in one week, how much will his total earnings for the week be? So, this is a commission problem here. So in order to calculate commission, you take um, the commission rate, which is 8%. Now I need to change this to a decimal. So change percent to a decimal. Now as a decimal, 8%, the decimal is here. You need to move it two places to the left. So one, two okay that's a, that's what i can do to that's to my uh, percent the other way to think about it is all percents can be or out of or out of 100. um if you needed to you can actually do the division where you can say 100 into eight um you will eventually get to the zero Point zero eight. That could be a whole nother lesson in itself, but that's how you can think of it. So, anywho, eight percent as a decimal is going to be zero point zero eight. All right. So, in order to calculate my commission, I need to multiply the zero point zero eight times the amount of um, my sale amount. So, Dominic sold four thousand two hundred thirteen dollars worth of merchandise. So. We have 0 0.08 times 4,213. Now, whatever this amount is, we're going to add it to the $285 because he gets that by default. Okay. What do these comments say? Oh, Chris. <laughs> hey, Chris Davis. This is for you. I know you already got your high school diploma, but I know you got some math you got to be doing. So, you know, you need to hit me up. I got you, boo. So, let's go ahead and calculate this part here. So, normally I would do this with a calculator, but uh, like I said on the previous week, I'm not sure what you can do with uh, the GED. Do they allow you to use the calculator or do they allow you to use it on certain parts? Oh, you have the answer? What was the answer, Cheryl? Don't let me know. What's the answer to this? Tell me. Put it in the comments. I'll wait for that one. What you put? Let me see what you put. You put no count. You put no answer yet. Let me see. Three times eight, twenty-four. Then I got ten. That's sixteen, seventeen. Oh Lord, I'm messing up. Right here, mess around with Chris. It's gonna be thirty-three. Okay, again, I need to go two decimal places. Oh, look at you. Let me see if I get to that. You said the answer is $622.04. Okay, let me see. Let me see. Now I'm going to add this number to the 285. So this is what we did. So we'll get ahead of ourselves. This he earned on commission. He earned $337.04. And now we're going to add the $285 to this quantity. And in the comments, we already got an answer. $622.04. Oh, my goodness. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you are right. Now, let's do another question, Chris. You ready? Let's do this one. Okay. So this question here says, a scientist is studying red maple tree growth in a state park. She measured the trunk diameters of a sample of trees in the same month 
every other year. The tables show the data for two of the trees. So we have tree number one and we have tree number two. And in both tables, we see the year in one column and then we have the diameter in the other column. So that goes for tree number one and tree number two. That's the information we see in the tables. And so the bottom part says, this is the final year in which she will collect data. When her data collection is complete, she will predict further red maple tree growth. So on this side, it says the scientist plots the, plots the data for tree two on a coordinate grid. She begins by plotting data for year three and year 11. What are the locations of the two points on the coordinate grid? Click on the, well, this is something that they have to do, click on the grid to plot the points. But of course, I'm not, I don't have that, I'm using a pencil. Um, so tree number two, and then year three and year 11. So year three, and year 11. Now these are ordered pairs. The first ordered pair is 3 and 12. So 3 and 12 is, you start on the x-axis first, x comma y. That's what the ordered pair is. So x is going to be 3, then you count all the way up to 12. Make sure I line this up right, and I get boom. That's where I put the first dot. The other dot is going to be at 11 and 14.4. And so this is 11 here on the x-axis, and we go all the way up to 14.4, which is between 15. Lord, I'm not, no, let me get my, get my eyes right on this grid here. And we are here. I see you, Chris. 12 y axis on 3. Okay, Chris, I see you. I see you. Thank you, sir. Now let's do another question. You ready? Okay, so this um, part on the left hand side is the same information that we had on the previous question. See? Same thing. Previous question, next question. Same stuff. So I'm not going to read that part. On this side, on the right-hand side, it says the scientist creates an equation that models her data for each tree so that she can predict the diameter in the future. Complete the linear equations that fit the data for tree one, where X is the year and Y is the trunk diameter in inches. Um, click on the variables and blah, blah, blah to move. That's, with that program. Okay, we need to come up with an equation. So in order to come up with the equation, they are looking for you to, on the formal side of math, they're looking for you to recognize that you have the slope intercept form. Okay, that's on the math side, but on the common sense side, you just need to think about what's happening from year to year to year. So let's look at the data for tree number one. So we she collects data every two years. So look at this. From year one to year three, the difference is two. And if you look, it's from three to five, it's two right here. Five to seven is two. And she keeps the same pattern every time. Okay. Now from year one to year three, you need to find the difference between 18.6 and 19.2. So let's do that math. What is, um, we could subtract them to 19.2 minus 18.6. And so that's gonna get me 0 0.6. So for two years, the diameter is growing 0. 0.6 inches. That's over two years. But what is it for one year? For one year, it's just going to grow 0.3. That's it. So that's what you need to pick here. So we're going to say that for every year, which is represented by the letter X, we're going to put 0.3 for each 
for every year. But now we need to figure out what goes in the other box. So in the other box, you need to figure out well, where did the diameter start? And that's at year one. So our initial rate or our initial value for the diameter is going to be the 18.6. And that's what you're going to put here. So we start at 18.6 and every year we're going to tackle on 0.3 times the number of years. And that's it. So that's how you do it, I would say, the common sense way, the real world way, without using your formal math skills. But if you know formal math and you know use working with slope and y intercept, then that's what this is. So let's keep going. Now, again, we got the same information on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have another situation. So it says in year 13, the scientists will put tree wrap around tree one to protect it from winter snow. The height of the tree wrap needs to be 45 inches. The wrap is priced by square foot. The nearest to the nearest square foot, how many square feet of wrap does she need? Now, this right here. It's kind of like geometry. Now I need you to use your imagination. Um, this tree wrap is, you see it and it looks like, okay, it's just, it's wrapped around a tree. But before it gets wrapped, it looks like a rectangle. Let's use a different color. It looks like a rectangle. Okay. This is what it looks like before it is wrapped around the tree. It's just a sheet like this and then they wrap it okay so what they're saying here is that this is 45 inches okay but what is this part here so oh let me do this like this what is this length right here can y'all see that color i guess y'all can see it so this part was a circle Okay, and then in that circle with year number, with tree number one and diameter from the year of year 13, the diameter was 22.2 inches. That's what that was. So what you want to know is what's this distance around the circle? So that means we need to find the circumference of the circle. So in order to do that, the circumference, which is like the same thing as the perimeter of a circle, is going to be C equals pi times D. Or in this case, it's going to be C equals 3.14 times 22.2. So the circumference, now this I am going to use my calculator because I ain't got time. Where my phone at, honey? Let's see here. Let's get my calculator. So we're going to do 3.14 times 22.2. So my diameter is going to be um, 69.708 inches. Okay. So this over here is 69 point seven zero eight inches now before I even ca start calculating the area um, of this um, sheet I need to convert both my inches to feet because my final answer needs to be in square feet so I can't do the inches thing I have to do square feet so what I know about inches the relationship between inches and feet I know that it takes one, I guess I should write over here, one foot is equal to 12 inches. Okay, so we need to convert both of them. So if I have one foot is equal to 12 inches, then I need to say, well, how many feet is it going to be with 45 inches? And that's just basic division. So I need to say 45 inches divided by 12 inches and 
that's going to get me 3.75. So right there, 3.75, in this case, it's going to be feet. And I need to do the same thing for this one. So if I have 69.708 inches divided by 12 inches, let's do that one, 69 points, oops, 9.708 divided by 12 I get 5.809 okay so now I've converted both of them to feet now it's time to figure out well, what is going to be um, this in square feet so in order to find the area of a rectangle a equals length times the width and remember, we're using the feet conversions now. So this is feet right here. So now I'm going to say area is equal to 3.75 times 5.809. And of course, both of these are in feet. And so my area is going to come out to be 21.78 square feet. Now, it says uh, to the nearest foot, so that means to the nearest whole number. And because this is a 7, I need to add 1 to the 1. And so my area is going to be 22 square feet, which is this one here. Okay, let's go to the next question. So for this problem here, it says the graph shows the level of ibuprofen Y units in a patient's bloodstream X hours after the ibuprofen was taken. Um, the level of ibuprofen in the patient's bloodstream increased blank hours, blank hours to blank hours. Okay, so they're looking for when did the bloodstream increase? So according to our chart or our table here, we on the x-axis we have the time since the ibuprofen was taken and then on the y-axis we have the ibuprofen level which is in units so if you notice um the increase is going from zero the graph is increasing from zero to six on the y-axis that's when it's increasing but the y-axis is talking about the level the ibuprofen level here it says when is the ibuprofen level increasing but from what they want to know the time so they got the hours so if it's going from zero to six on the y-axis where is it going from on the x-axis so in this case it starts at zero but then it goes down here to be a little bit less than one so I'm going to pick zero is where it starts, but then what's the, which one of these numbers in my second drop down is less than one? And the answer is two thirds. Everything else is greater than one. This is two and a half hours, five hours, six hours, eight hours, and we don't want that. So between zero and two thirds of an hour, that's when the uh, the levels of ibuprofen in patient has increased in the bloodstream. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so an office uses paper drinking cups in the shape of a cone with dimensions as shown. So we have the height of the cone is four inches, and then we have a diameter of the base of the cone at two and three quarter inches. All right. So now it says um, to the nearest tenth of the cubic inch, what is the volume of each um, drinking cup? So in order to find the volume of a cone, the formula is V equals one third times the area of the base times the height. Now we use capital B to say the area of the base. And I'm going to put this area 
of the base. So you look at the base of your picture. What shape is this? In this case, the base is a circle. So in this case, you're going to say area is equal to pi r squared. So, wait, this here. What? What are you? <laughs> Chris, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, anywho, if I rewrite this equation, it's going to be V equals one third. The area of the base is pi r squared and then times the height of the cone. So, in this case, we need to figure out two pieces of information. What's the value of R and the value of H? So we got H already. So H is equal to four inches. But in order to find the um, the radius, you, the radius is going to be half your diameter. So my radius is going to be the current diameter, which is two and three fourths, divided by two. So let's keep going with calculating this. You have two and three fourths, and you need to multiply this um, mixed number by the reciprocal of the second number, which is one half. So now I'm going to change my mixed number, which is two and three fourths, to an improper fraction. So this is going to be 11 over four times one half, and I get 11 over eight. So that's going to be my radius. Now I can plug in all my information. So V is equal to one third times 3.14 times the radius of 11 over 8. And I have to square it times the height of 4 inches. So we're going to put that in the calculator. That's what we're going to do. That's what we got to do. So we're going to say one third. So that's one divided by three. And then we're going to multiply that by pi, which is 3.14. And then I'm going to go ahead and multiply it by four just so I can get that out of the way. Now we got to do that 11 over eight and we got to square it. Well, 11 squared is 121. So I'm going to multiply this by 121. And then I'm going to divide it by 8 squared, which is 64. Okay? Now, what is going to be the volume? The volume came out to be 7.91 and so on. So they say to the nearest tenth of the cubic inch. Uh, what is the volume? So we can round this off to 7.9 cubic inches. That's what we got. Answer choice B. Alright. I think I'm almost done. Hold on, let me see. Oh, I got another question. Okay, I think this might be the last question. So it says there are S steps from the pedestal to the head of the Statue of Liberty. The number of steps in the Washington Mon Monument is 27 less than six times the number of steps in the Statue of Liberty. Which expression represents the number of steps in the Washington Monument in terms of X? So there's no calculating here. They just want you to create the expression based on the wording. So this is the main portion here. The Washington Monument is, when you see that word is, that means equal. The Washington Monument is 27 less than six times the number of steps in the Statue of Liberty. So we represent the number of steps in the Statue of Liberty with the variable S. So we have, when they say 27 less than, that means that you're going to subtract the 27, the number 27. So we first we got to represent this part here. Six times the number of steps is 6s. And then you're going to subtract 27. And then you're done. That's it. That's it. That's all. 
All right, so the answer here is going to be C. And we are done for the evening. We're done for this evening. I hope you have enjoyed your time in Mrs. Taylor's math class today. I certainly have enjoyed myself doing some GED math. If you know anyone who is interested in taking the GED and they need some help or some a refresher course or just somebody to help them remember what they used to learn back in the day and when they were in school, tell them, send them my way. I can help them out. Okay, so that is it for tonight. Um, I'll see you next Monday and talk talk for now. Bye bye.